Brady asked me about hafnium, and it turns out it's far more exciting than I thought. It burns really well. It has a great backstory. It has strange links to mobile phones and to nuclear reactors, and it's very expensive. What more could Brady want? Hafnium is element 72. On the periodic table, it's on the same group as titanium and zirconium, and hafnium is underneath. That turns out to be a really important fact in its discovery. 2023 is a really important year for hafnium because it was discovered, at least the paper announcing its discovery was published on the 20th of January 1923. So it's just over 100 years old. It wasn't isolated immediately, but that's when its existence was proved. That paper gave rise to one of the biggest rows in science at the beginning of the 20th century. I inquired about hafnium to our friend Tony Lipman. He said, it's a really hot metal. Everyone wants some. But we, on periodic table of videos, are his friends. So he'd find some for us. And it arrived by post a few days ago. Two samples. One, a nice packet with two pieces of very shiny metal, and the other one with a much larger lump, but which had interesting features, almost crystallites in it. Neil was very excited. But it turns out that it's really tough. Neil tried to straighten it with his hands. He was defeated, so he needed to use a hammer. I'd never seen metallic hafnium and I didn't know much about it. And I read that it didn't dissolve in acids easily, but I thought, there's a challenge for Neil. So Neil got out his fuming nitric acid, which he believes dissolves everything. But hafnium was completely untouched by it. Neil's nitric acid has met its match. And we tried another acid, concentrated hydrochloric acid, still nothing. But Neil would not be defeated, so he brought out the aqua regia, which dissolves gold. Aqua regia is a mixture of HCl hydrochloric acid and concentrated nitric acid. And they react together to make a much more corrosive solution. And hafnium, much to Neil's pleasure, began to react, though it was a bit slow. And Neil said, even gold reacts faster with aqua regia. And being Neil, he produced a small piece of gold. And we ran them in competition. The gold was a bit slow getting started. But by the time that Neil and Brady were packing up, it had largely dissolved and the hafnium was still there. Some time later, this is the gold and the hafnium. You shake it and see if it, see if it is, but I don't think it is. Ah, oh, there's a bit there, yeah. So let me explain about its discovery. Even Mendeleev thought that there should be another element on the periodic table where hafnium is but everything was confused by the discovery of the rare earths. There was some discussion, would hafnium be the last of the rare earths, or would it be the first of the next row of transition metals? The transition metals are the metals that go across the periodic table from left to right. And so uh, the French chemist Aubin, the one who discovered lutetium, thought, that he would look among the rare earths. And before the First World War, he thought he discovered element 72, which he gave the name celtium, or it may be keltium, from like the word, English word Celtic, C-E-L-T-I-U-M. Then it turned out 
that he'd made a mistake. So when he and a colleague published again after the First World War, in 1922, people didn't really want to believe him. He was the boy who cried wolf. Precisely. And then in 1923, a Hungarian chemist working in Denmark called the Hevesy, together with a Dutch colleague, Costa, published the paper in the journal Nature, which described their discovery of element 72. And the paper's quite interesting because, first of all, the editor writes that he takes no responsibility for the content of the paper, whether it's right or wrong. And secondly, it was published very quickly and is very short, like most of these papers announcing discoveries of new elements. And because they were working in Denmark, in Copenhagen, they decided to call it hafnium from the Latin word, or what they believed was the Latin name of Copenhagen, which is hafnium. I don't know, it's a Latin name that is like hafnium. Where did celtium come from? Why did the other guy want celtic? It's because the original inhabitants of France were Celts. In English, they were Celts. I suspect in French, they would be called Celt. They were both rather patriotic names. And the French were really against the d paper from Denmark because de Hevesy, who was the lead author, had fought on the Austrian side in the First World War. And it was only five years after the end of the war, so it was nerves were a bit raw. Hafnium was supported by Niels Bohr, the very famous physicist, and Celtium was supported by Ernest Rutherford. And so they were both trying behind the scenes to bend the ear of the editor of Nature, who's reputed to have allowed Bohr to read the proofs of the French papers before they were published. I think nowadays, after 100 years, we can say it was all a bit dodgy. Eventually, Hafnium triumphed. I think it's a better name because Celtium is really a bit like Cerium and probably would confuse generations of students. Now, the real reason that they were successful is the pair in Denmark realised that Hafnium was in the Zirconium group. So they were looking in Zirconium minerals. You can see here it's a couple of nice samples of Zirconium metal also from Antony, and hafnium is found as an impurity in um, zirconium when you isolate it from the minerals. The French team, because they thought it was a rare earth, were looking at the minerals from Itaby and places like that where there are tiny traces of hafnium, but it's enormously more difficult to find it. So all the signals in their spectra were very weak. So there's quite a good moral for you. If you're going to look for an element, look at the periodic table first so you know where to look. Now, we come to the most exciting part that Neil discovered. Neil took his file and started making finely divided filings of hafnium. Neil, as you know, is not a small guy and he found it really quite hard to abrade much of it off the piece of hafnium. They didn't trust my shaking hands to hold it, so Connor, our other technician, came to hold the paper. And when Neil sprinkled the hafnium dust into the Bunsen flame, it burned to make presumably the oxide. It was really quite artistic. Wow, that's, that's impressive. There's a lot going on there. Brady, who'd been a little bored up to this point, started getting really excited. And a big smile spread upon Neil's face. And 
this demonstrates the other thing I read, which is that high temperature happens in bones, but only when it's very finely divided. Brady, who thinks about the periodic table probably more than the rest of us, pointed out that he wasn't very surprised that hafnium burnt well because zirconium burnt quite nicely as, as well. If you watch our zirconium video, you will see similar flames when we draw, or sparks when we drop in the zirconium. My personal feeling is that hafnium was a little bit better because it's denser and therefore it falls better into the flame because the flame you imagine is very turbulent with the burning and so it's easy for the particles to be knocked out. It's up to you to judge. This brings us to why we have hafnium at all because until very recently it hasn't had many uses. It has a very high melting point. Apparently it was used in the nozzles for the rocket motors on the lunar lander on the Apollo mission. Two, one, ignition. Right away, Houston. That's your good. Unfortunately, it also has a disadvantage that it absorbs neutrons. And therefore, it is a very bad impurity to have in nuclear reactors. This matters because zirconium is used for cladding the fuel rods in a nuclear reactor. So the hafnium that we have is a byproduct of the zirconium industry for the nuclear power plants. So without nuclear power plants, we probably wouldn't have much production of hafnium at all. So basically, when they're producing the pure zirconium, they have to get all the hafnium out. Yes, but now it has suddenly become really important material because in electronics, as you probably know, transistors, which are at the heart of whatever computer or um, phone that you're watching this on, the transistors get smaller and smaller and smaller. And as they get smaller, you need more specialized materials to act as insulators. And hafnium oxides turn out to be very good for making computer chips, really high purity. And this is now where most of the hafnium from the nuclear industry is going. And there's another really exciting development. If you have a smartphone, and most people do now, you probably don't realize that inside the screen that's just under the glass, there is an electrically conducting layer which is transparent so that you can see the display. And at the moment, most phones use indium but indium is getting scarcer and it is now being realized that perhaps it could be replaced by hafnium or compound of hafnium. I'm not sure if I've ever shown you a patent, but this is a recent one from the Korean company Samsung. Patents are legal documents. They're usually very boring to read, but you can see from the title this talks about transparent screens. And at the back of the patent, they're the claims where they claim what their new invention can do. And you can see there's a whole list of claims, some of which involve screens. So it may well be that your future phones will have hafnium in them. You can support our videos and have your name appear on our periodic table of patrons. There's a link to our Patreon in the video description where you can find out more. And last time I checked, no one's put their name on Hafnium yet. You could be the first. And there's an equilibrium. Some are coming off and an equal number are going back on to the sol surface. So if you just have the gold in there, it appears to be unaffected. If you were on an atomic scale, you'd see atoms coming off and others going back. 